With a series as massive as SpongeBob SquarePants, it's hard for anything relating to it to fall into obscurity. Even still, the SpongeBob PC games managed to slip under many people's radars, and to this day, only a good few people who grew up playing them are actually familiar with these titles. While there are a great many, and I would like to eventually cover all of them, let's focus on the first SpongeBob point-and-click game put out by AWE Games and published by THQ. This is SpongeBob SquarePants, Employee of the Month. Unlike most other SpongeBob PC games, Employee of the Month was its own original story, not based on a movie or another video game. This is ironic given the fact it shares a name with a pretty famous episode. This great childhood relic tells the story of SpongeBob receiving tickets to the theme park Neptune's Paradise, a reward for being Employee of the Year. Great, the title's already lied to us. However, he and Patrick's journey to the Land of Wonders is met by many roadblocks and conflicts they must overcome to reach their destination. Will SpongeBob ever make it to the theme park to have the time of his young life? Let's find out. The game kicks off with a comical intro, showing the characters posing for the logo in a set resembling SpongeBob's room. This is a nice little fourth wall break, though it's never entirely explained in the story why they're all there or what exactly they're filming. Either way, Mr. Krabs receives mail right there on the set, and Squidward overhears that he's received two free tickets to Neptune's Paradise. Being the kind and generous neighbor he is, in a strange act of kindness for the character, Squidward suggests Mr. Krabs give the tickets to SpongeBob for being Employee of the Year. Mr. Krabs does exactly that, and SpongeBob decides to give his other ticket to Patrick. Now they're ready to set off on a grand adventure. Only one problem. They have no idea how to get there. Clearly, this game came out before the internet and cell phones were as widely used as they are today. In the first stage, we see SpongeBob going to the Krusty Krab to ask for directions. If you ask the ultra-kind Squidward, he politely tells you off. And if you ask Mr. Krabs, he tells you he doesn't know and that he needs to get to the bargain mart for something. Wonder what that could be. Only person left to ask is this random fish. Oh wait, he's hungry and won't tell you anything until you give him a Krabby Patty. You gather ingredients from around the restaurant, wash a plate, and then present him with the glorious burger. He then tells you you can get to Neptune's Paradise by taking the route at the bus stop. When you get there, you find Patrick with a sweet camera that he won in a bikini contest, supposedly for having the most unique figure. However, a new problem arises when you realize you don't have any bus tokens. Patrick comes up with this genius idea to find buried treasure to pay for the bus ride, since the Flying Dutchman's buried treasure was somewhere at Goo Lagoon. Before you go there, however, you can stop by this little store and see what is doing? And you can also talk to the clerk to get this cool videotape. The videotapes only really serve as bonus features, so you can do without them. At Goo Lagoon, there's a little mini game you can play that doesn't do anything, and a cool tanning salon castle by the looks of it. When you go to Muscle Beach, you see Larry working out, and he has the perfect toy shovel and pail to dig up treasure with. However, he refuses to give them to you since they're his best friends, apparently. I think all bodybuilders should have a toy shovel and pail they carry around with them everywhere. Talking to him exploits that he misses eating homemade pies, so who better to get a homemade pie from than Grandma Squarepants? Also, the guy in the background is named Arnie, apparently. You can head to Grandma's house, and she literally does not recognize you at all. That's a little cruel, don't you think, developers? Ignoring SpongeBob's tragic family life, Grandma says she can't make her famous homemade pie because she's all out of urchin chips. Now it's off to the Bargain Mart. Here you meet this hilarious teenage clerk who has the best way of pronouncing Bargain Mart ever. Welcome to the Bargain Mart. Unfortunately, you haven't found your buried treasure yet, so you don't have any money. He makes a deal with you to clean his car in exchange for the urchin chips, and you get this fun mini game where you can clean the car by moving SpongeBob across it. The minigame is a nice touch, but it feels a little out of place since there really aren't any other minigames like it throughout the game. I should also mention the guy who comes out wearing Mr. Krabs' clothes. That probably doesn't mean anything. Once you go back inside, you can now get your urchin chips, so you head to the back and... Mr. Krabs is holding his own sale of junk in the bargain mart, and he just sold off his clothes. He gives you a bottle of cooking oil for free since he's just trying to get rid of it, so you can get both your urchin chips and cooking oil for free. But Grandma doesn't need the cooking oil for the pie, so you can just hold on to that. You bring the pie to Larry, and he's overcome by temptation. He eats it and has to go for a jog to run it off, allowing you to steal his beach toys for your own nefarious purposes. Damn, SpongeBob is evil in this game. You head into the tanning salon castle, only to find out it's actually just a beach. You speak to its owner, Ray soaking up Ray's, and you trade him your cooking oil for his sunscreen. SpongeBob says it best, fish that cook themselves. 
Wait, that infers the consumption of fish is a known thing in Bikini Bottom. If you think that's creepy, just wait a couple levels. You can creep on some of the beachgoers, or you can go to a bunch of sand pits to dig up the Dutchman's treasure. You have to dig until you find the right one, but there's no penalty for getting it wrong, really. When you dig up the treasure, you find it's just a chest full of bus tokens. Wow, Neptune must really be on your side here. When you bring the bus tokens to Patrick, the bus driver shows up, but he's terrible at his job because he doesn't want to drive because it's going to rain. He says he'll drive you if you can give him an umbrella, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense because he'd be in the bus the whole time. But hey, it's Spongebob. You go back to the beach and find an old English lady who Spongebob shamelessly mocks the accent of. To get her parasol, you give her Ray's sunscreen as a trade, and you bring it back to the bus driver. After some pleading from Spongebob, the driver gives in and decides to drive you and Patrick in spite of the storm. Now we're on to level 2, which takes place in Rock Bottom. For some reason, pretty much every Spongebob video game loved to make use of this location. I guess it made for a pretty creepy setting, but it's still weird considering it only ever appeared in one episode. As you can guess, the bus ride didn't go so well, and surprisingly, it didn't have anything to do with Plankton. The sneaky little bugger climbed on board because he's going somewhere, I guess. Even major villains have to get around somehow. So an actual tornado appears, which Spongebob calls the Raging Whirlpool. God, I would kill for his optimism. And it carries the bus off to rock bottom. Outside, you see a guy kicking a can, and he looks suspiciously like the guy from the Krusty Krab. He blames the inclement weather on a wizard named Marlin, who many people mention throughout the level. You steal his can and run away. Now you can go into the bus stop to talk to the woman behind the desk. Patrick also ran off somewhere, but the bus driver is sitting on the couch watching a parody of Chips called Chimps. God, I love you, Spongebob. The bus routes are cancelled because of the storm, so since you're going to be in rock bottom for a while, you ask the receptionist about the sights to see. She refuses to tell you until you get her a kelp bar, which in my opinion is a fireable offense for a receptionist. You go outside and use the bathroom, but in a moment of hilarity... <laughs> on the bright side, you find a quarter in the sewer. You use this quarter on the nearby snack machine to get a kelp bar. In exchange, the receptionist tells you that her twin sister works in a nearby radio station. Upon heading there, everything's a kerfuffle because the radio's antenna is broken and a guy is out back fixing it. On top of it, the wizard we heard about cursed the back door so it would never open. As it turns out, a celebrity news reporter named Gary Gulper works here, and the locked room houses his new invention, because news reporters invent things. It's so surreal to see Rock Bottom treated as an actual civilization and not just a creepy dark trench where monsters live. It's actually kind of nice. Also, we get this little line of fourth wall breaking. Ooh, Operation Krabby Patty. That was my very first game. Actually, SpongeBob, it was Legend of the Lost Spatula on the Game Boy Color. The guy out back is angry because the antenna isn't actually broken, and you'll never believe what his name is. You ask to borrow his really neat tools for something. He says you can borrow them if you bring him a kelp seed, the Spongebob version of Pepsi. So you head to the Rusty Anchor Tavern where Mermaid Man and Barnacle Boy are in the parking lot. Imagine going to a bar in a strange lost town and meeting two major celebrities in the parking lot. Either way, Mermaid Man just lost a major drinking contest to Patrick and now he's too sick to move. You need help from a big buff guy to lift him into the invisible boatmobile. You tell the big tough guy inside about it, and he asks you to watch the bar for him while he goes to help Mermaid Man. He sure is a lot nicer than the guys over at Thug Tug. You can now get a glass of Diet Kelpsy since Mermaid Man and Patrick drank all the regular Kelpsy. However, to deceive the Joe Star repairman, you put the Kelpsy in the can you stole from the guy at the bus stop earlier. He approves of it and lets you borrow his tools. You can now pretend to be the repairman, so the receptionist lets you go backstage to meet Gary Gulper. But wait! You can also go to the recording room to see Plankton trying to film a commercial for the Chum Bucket. However, he fools you into thinking it's a public service announcement, and he makes you record him. It's pretty funny, but kind of meaningless apart from the bonus videotape you get from it. I, for one, think we need more PSAs about the benefits of eating Chum. Now you can go backstage and meet Gary Gulper, who is way too full of himself. He tells you about his invention that's capable of controlling the weather, but he also mentions the folktale that tells of the wizard Marlin, who controls the weather in Rock Bottom. There's a possibility that Marlin is making it storm out of anger. From looking at the little radar, you can find the coordinates to a zone where the weather never changes. You assume this is Marlin's lair, and you head there to confront the wizard. His lair turns out to be an oversized hat, which houses a maze of caves. You can spin the slot machine out front to find the order you take the paths in the maze, and you're able to travel through an overhead game all the way to Marlin's private quarters where, hey, what's Patrick doing here? 
It's never actually explained, but Marlin's a nice guy who's letting Patrick sleep off his kelpsy drunkenness. Marlin says he won't stop making it rain until Gary Gulper pays for trying to steal his job. SpongeBob offers to do what he does best, cause chaos, and Marlin comes up with an idea. Marlin gives you the magic wand and asks you to sabotage Gary Gulper's machine while posing as JoJo. This way, Marlin will have full control of the weather again. In order to make it stop raining, you oblige and proceed to destroy the machine by unlocking the cursed door with the magic wand. We get a fun little cutscene of Spongebob and Patrick destroying everything, then everything returns to normal. You ride off on the bus back to Bikini Bottom, leaving Rock Bottom behind you, but the bus driver is slowly getting fed up with his passenger's antics. He decides to kick them off the bus by a diner, and this kicks off the next level, back to square one. Inside the diner, Patrick is indulging in a pretty tasty-looking sandwich, and Spongebob is about ready to give up on his journey. However, with encouragement from Patrick, he decides to keep going and thinks of a brilliant idea. Rather than just, you know, getting another bus, he thinks to get Sandy's rocket to fly them to Neptune's paradise. Pretty excessive, don't you think? By complete coincidence, the waitress just got an order from Sandy, who's in Jellyfish Fields, because I guess Sandy Jellyfish is now. The waitress takes your word for it when you tell her you know Sandy because she sends you to give Sandy her baby back ribs in Jellyfish Fields. Okay, honestly, everyone with a job in this game should seriously be fired. How irresponsible can you get? In Jellyfish Fields, you can get stung by jellyfish, but it doesn't really do anything. There isn't like a health bar or anything like that. You bring Sandy her baby back ribs, and by yet another complete coincidence, Sandy has tickets to Neptune's Paradise too. You might be thinking this is pretty absurd, but believe it or not, the game actually kind of explains this. Apparently, almost everyone around town seems to be getting these tickets, and while we never find out why they're going around, we can probably just assume the theme park felt generous. Ever hear of junk mail that actually follows through on its promises? Maybe I shouldn't be deleting all those random emails. You head back home to get your water helmet, but get this, there's a freaking snake in it! Why in the holy mother of Poseidon does Spongebob have a snake in his house? Are sea snakes a common pest in Bikini Bottom? How much did this game build on the Spongebob lore? Besides the snake, you can find the easiest videotape ever just by opening your closet. Now, you do have to go to Squidward's house to borrow his clarinet. Apparently, Spongebob has a degree in snake charming and can use the clarinet to charm the snake away. Only one problem. Squidward is fast asleep and won't wake up at all. Now would be a great time for Spongebob's lovely coincidence blessing to kick in. Oh, look at that. A store on the TV sells dream glasses. Glasses that literally take you into someone else's dream. I have many, many, many questions, but my mind's already been boggled enough by the weather controlling wizard, so let's just roll with it. You head to the store to get the dream glasses, and I never knew how much I needed to hear Spongebob reference the Doobie Brothers. Also, take a wild guess at who you meet inside. It's the guy from the Krusty Krab and Rock Bottom Bus Stop. He sure gets around, doesn't he? Even still, he denies ever seeing you before in his life. The guy at the store gives you the dream glasses for free because he doesn't believe in money, relying solely on a trust fund to keep his store running. With these, you can go into Squidward's dream and oh my gosh, you become a conglomeration of horrifying sorts. Walking through a simultaneously heavenly and hellish tentacle acres, you reach a building where Squidward is giving a god-awful clarinet recital to an adoring audience. You just up and walk on stage with him and pretend to be him from another dream. You tell him you need the clarinet, and he's actually in a dance recital, and believe it or not, he believes you. He gives you his clarinet and begins dancing, but we don't really see any audience reaction, so the joke is kind of lost on me. Still funny in concept, though. Good effort. Somehow bringing the clarinet into the real world, you go to charm the snake, and you can now use your water helmet to enter Sandy's tree dome. However, she's ready to give you one last mission before you go. She's lost the oxygen tanks. You don't have to look very far to find them, so I'm not really sure why this obstacle exists. Maybe it's to preview the fact that the oxygen tanks will be in your inventory for the grand majority of the next level. Patrick shows up after eating the entire diner, and he ends up standing on the line while the oxygen is being pumped into the rocket. It breaks, which prevents the rocket from being fully fueled, but somehow Sandy fails to notice this. Like in the bus, chaos ensues in the rocket. Patrick regrets eating so much when he has to use the bathroom, and Sandy realizes the rocket is out of oxygen. Because of this, it crashes through a billboard and breaks down in the middle of a fancy neighborhood called Bottoms Up, as opposed to Bikini Bottom. This is the final stage of the game. Patrick runs off to find a bathroom while Sandy starts to work on fixing the rocket. She sends you to Oxygen Springs to fill up the empty oxygen tanks, but once you get there, the talking security camera says you can't come in because their guests are required to wear a jacket. You head back to tell Sandy about your problems, and she happens to have a friend who lives nearby. His name is Calfish Craig, and he lives in a very high-class neighborhood, or rather, outside of it, called Waverly Hills. 
When you get to Waverly Hills, the gates are locked, and you have to open them by applying pressure to a platform outside. To do this, you drink a ton of water from a fountain and become bloated enough to weigh down the platform. Also outside, you find a regular boring old coconut that you may or may not find useful later. You head inside to find quite a few gorgeous looking houses, including one made entirely out of gold. Right across the fence is a dirty old shack that could only belong to a certain cowfish Craig. His neighbor, Carlton Ritz, is angry because his tree of golden coconuts leaned over the fence and Cowfish Craig took one of them. That bastard, doesn't he know they take longer to grow than a platinum plum? Carlton promises you a king's ransom if you return his coconut, which he could probably give due to obvious wealth. You go into the nice old shack, which actually looks kind of cozy, and you have a nice little chat with Cowfish Craig. Surprisingly, he doesn't mention Sandy once, just how much he hates his neighbor and all the rich people who live across from him. He's also from Texas somehow. Calfish Craig tells you you can probably get a jacket at Sublime Seafood since they always give them to their customers before seating them. After gaining his trust, you sneak in his back room to steal his golden coconut, and I think this is supposed to be a Raiders of the Lost Ark parody? I'm not sure, but there was a period in time where everyone parodied that scene, so it probably is. You swap the golden coconut for the regular one and return it to Carlton Ritz. Now for that ransom he promised you, a quarter. He probably found it in the sewers of Rock Bottom. After leaving the snobby neighborhood, you can magically reconstruct the sign you crashed through and get the phone number for Sublime Seafoods, 555-4444, probably the easiest number in telephone history. You use your quarter on a conveniently placed payphone to ask for the address, and off you go to a fancy dinner. When you get there, the very intimidating bouncer, sorry, the very unintimidating bouncer, tells you you can't come in without an invitation. Luckily for you, there's a contest going on that's giving out a free invitation to anyone who can guess the company's new slogan. The contest is a little awful because it's literally on the restaurant's sign. You use some public binoculars to look over the kelp forest, wow, canon location placement, and you get a nice view of the slogan, which is simply tastes like chicken. Now, I have to address the elephant in the room here. This is a seafood restaurant under the ocean. It's a common joke that people will say human flesh tastes like chicken, so this game just straight up acknowledged its blatant cannibalism in the most unsubtle way possible. Cannibalism is actually a thing in the Spongebob universe, and no one has a problem with it. I mean, I guess nature does involve every living creature feeding off another, so I'm not sure why I'm surprised, but I didn't expect it to be canon here. Has this fact ever been acknowledged in the show? I'm at a loss for words, but we have a game to finish. I'll leave this up to the theorists. When you get inside, the shrimp Matra D sends you to get a jacket from their closet. Once you're looking snazzy, you can head into the restaurant where Larry's twin brother serves you. He probably serves his brothers, too. He tells you a bunch of menu items if you ask for them, but the idiotic sponge somehow thinks he can get a Krabby Patty in this foreign land. This infuriates the waiter who views this as beneath their high society, so he physically throws Spongebob out of the restaurant and forgets to take his jacket back. Again, I say, everyone with a job in this game needs to be fired. Now you can get into Oxygen Springs, where you find exactly where Patrick ended up going to the bathroom. He tells you he got in by climbing over some coral, which makes you feel like a complete buffoon, but at least you got a fun adventure out of it. He can't leave yet, though, because he's lost his pants. You go to find them, and a videotape, and look who it is. The same guy you've seen in every town. SpongeBob is downright insistent he's seen this guy before, but his suspicions are laid to rest when a series of guys who look exactly like him walk through. Turns out this guy has tons of twin brothers all over the ocean. Nice to see some finality to this little subplot. Also, one of them had Patrick's pants for some reason. You return the pants to Patrick, and he's ready to go. You fill the oxygen tanks and head back to finish your adventure. Once you arrive at Neptune's Paradise, you're shocked to find the park is closed. Apparently, there's a reservation for a party. For who, you ask? Spring Boob Squire Pin. Nah, it's actually Spongebob. And all your friends jump out and yell surprise. So that's why everyone around town got invitations out of the blue. You get a montage of you and all the characters in the game playing at the park with a series of reused sound clips. At the end of the day, everyone walks off into the sunset and the game ends. How did that marvelous adventure hold up? It's campy, it's goofy, there's a ton of things that don't make sense, but you know what? It's amazing. This game is so much fun and definitely one I can proudly say I spent half my childhood playing. It makes use of every Spongebob element it can and portrays the world in such a way that's enjoyable to play through and experience. AWE games may have been unique with their take on the Spongebob universe, but they sure did a good job with it. My biggest criticism would have to be the lack of features. I don't mind it being linear, but it's a little short, and as a kid I always tried to see if I could find new things to do after beating it for the billionth time. A short game, but a cute and enjoyable one. I absolutely love this game, and thinking about it almost brings a tear to my eye. 
Hopefully others who grew up with it feel the same way, because this is one Spongebob relic that should never, ever be forgotten. Thank you all so much for watching. I will see you in the next memory.